So folks, just that heads up is yes, this meeting is being recorded. What can and will be used against you. <laughs> All right, well, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna do uh, a little uh, entry, little intro slides that we do for the, uh, for the seed stuff. And then I'll hand it over to Petra. I'm oh, sorry, Petra, geez, why do I always do that? Sephra. Mm -hmm. Honor again to be called Petra. <laughs> two good friends, I keep uh, mixing up. Give me just a second. Okay, like I said, we have this wonderful session that we're joining, Ecotypes, Ecoregions, Ecological Restoration, uh, Part 1 Theory, uh, and we're so happy to have you. Uh, the SEED conference uh, that we've all been doing this week has just been a great collaboration between uh, folks in the SEED uh, business and in the interests uh, and with NOFA New York. We've been doing this every other year. And we're just so glad to have Sephra join, join us this year as a planner. And sort of out of the blue, she's like, wait, what if we put this together and we do our seed school that we were planning to do later on as part of this whole thing? And it's so great uh, that it just happened organically. So I apologize if my audio is a little, whoop, back one. Uh, these are the agreements that we are using today and through the week to respect each other. I'm not gonna read them all, but primarily it's one mic, one voice at a time. Be on mute if you're not speaking. Uh, be, be sure to speak from the eye, but uh, avoid jargon. Uh, that's something where we're trying to explain to folks who may not understand all the things that we work with daily and we're being respectful of that. Uh, be patient. Uh, this virtual platform is new to us and everybody at times has technical difficulties. Uh, the native land acknowledgement that we're doing today really is about acknowledging where we each are and the folks that live with have lived with and will live with the land that we are all residing upon. So please take a moment and in the chat, if you wish, acknowledge where you live. And if you know the indigenous community that uh, calls that place home and keeps that place home, please acknowledge that. We're also lucky to have the In Living Color virtual BIPOC space with us today. The Black Indigenous People of Color this have been with us all week and have been offering 24 hour service via email as well as by appointment uh, during, the, during the day. Uh, this is a community service for support uh, and really just uplifting each other's experiences. We've had a couple awesome keynotes this week. Uh, Laura Legnick, on Saturday, Banu Sabramaniam uh, last night was great. And then Brian Caldwell will be on uh, Saturday. We uh, are doing this post-conference needs assessment uh, thing on Sunday the 24th, moderated by Hannah Tragis and uh, Jackie Pilati, who've been teaching and moderating through the whole week. Uh, we look forward to having you join us so we can take stock, build a new table, for all of us uh, coming from different places and different interests with SEED. There's gonna be a free link I'll put in the chat. Uh, that's sort of a free access link to this thing on Sunday. You can't access it, access it through the Socio app. You have to go through this link. And with that, I'll turn it back to, to Sephra. I apologize if my audio is a little choppy. Thank you, Heron. Hello, everybody. Can you all see me, Karen? My, can you guys hear me? Is everything good? We can see you and hear you. Oh, great. Well, welcome everybody to the very first Ecotypic Seed School. Um, 
this is something I'm very excited about. I know everyone who is presenting is, um, and to all of you that are attending, um, Heron and everyone at New York NOFA, thank you so much for putting this wonderful conference on. It's been a great week full of amazing sessions um, into the Northeast Organic Seed Conference. It's wonderful to be here. Um, in terms of getting oriented in place-based, I am speaking to you all from Connecticut, which is um, a, comes from an Algonquin word that means the long tidal river as the Connecticut River runs up from almost the boundaries of Canada down to the Long Island Sound. So where I'm from was the traditional territory of the Pagasset tribe, which means mouth of the river. And indeed, I was born right where uh, the river feeds into the Long Island Sound and these beautiful estuaries and just beautiful native plants that proliferate the entire landscape. The area that I was born was referenced to as Matchamux, which means the beautiful land. And my work with the, the Connecticut chapter of the Northeast Organic Farming Association has been to lead our pollinator health initiative, the Ecotype Project. And um, we've been having some great sessions throughout this whole conference. We had a round table around what it would take to fortify an ecotypic seed network in the Northeast. Um, and we had a great conversation during the Pushing Boundaries session. And now today we will have a two-part session that explains both the theory and goes more into depth of why we think it's important to work on an eco-regional scale. What does that mean? What are ecotypes? What does that mean? Um, what does working with native plants mean? What's all the nuance around it? So this first section with Hope and Polly, who I'll introduce, we'll talk about that. And then we all will have to sign off at 2.15 and sign back into the second Zoom link where Michael Butts and Alexis Doshash will walk us through the practicality of actually implementing these ecotypes on the land. Our intention um, at this conference and with this seed school is to really help widen um, the information and the resources needed to include as many growers in as many places as we possibly can. So we really wanna provide this as resources to begin this conversation and form this seed network so that we can all be sharing, as Ken Green calls it, it within this seed shed, this ecotypic, eco-regional native seed that's so important for restoration. Um, we will answer questions at the end if we have time, but Michael, who's the instructor on the second part, will also be monitoring the chat to help answer any questions he can as we go, if there's anything that needs further clarification. And um, I also just wanted to mention CT NOFA also runs a wonderful organic land care program. And we um, are one of the only organizations that has an, accredited, an accreditation for that. And we have a course coming up for that um, right in early February. So I encourage you all to check that out and I'll put a link in the chat. And with that, I just wanna frame this conference um, or this conversation around you know, some statistics, Ed Toth and Sarah Tangren from our round table, they did this great study from people from every state east of the Mississippi about use of these ecotypes, which we'll talk about. And 74% um, of people who work with native plants said that they prefer these ecotypic materials, but only 12% can get it uh, commercially available uh, always. Um, 85% say they can't find it within their state and have to go 418 miles to access these materials. And beyond that, the second place they could go is 805 miles. So 83% um, said they'd be willing to pay a premium and 75% of those folks said that they only expect this demand to rise. So as we're talking about seed production, this is a really um, viable market that can help reduce fragmentation, support our local pollinators and wildlife corridors um, and be a great resource to provide local seeds so that we can ensure that we take care of our entomological friends and also have um, food security. So without further ado, I'm going to um, read the bios of our two instructors today. We have um, Polly Wiegan, who is the Science and Stewardship Program Manager at the Central Pine Barrens Joint Planning and Policy Commission. She's also Executive Director of the Long Island Native Plant Initiative. She has an MS in Urban Ecology from Hofstra University and is the Science and Stewardship Program Manager for the Central Pine Barrens, I already said that, uh, Commission, um, where she implements ecological management and monitoring, prescribed fire, forest pest surveys, and invasive species control. Um, 
So, and the LIMPI, the Long Island Native Plant Initiative is a nonprofit organization that conducts wildland seed collection, banking, and propagation to provide sources of ecologically appropriate native plant materials for use in commercial plant production, landscaping, and restoration. Polly also helps oversee the administration of the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area to further help protect ecosystems from the degrading effect of invasive species. So that's Polly and then Hope Leeson. Both of these folks were on the round table. So if you were there, you might now recognize these faces, but she is um, a botanist with the Rhode Island Natural History Survey with 35 years of experience in Southern New England. She spent time in Rhode Island's natural communities on a variety of projects, has given, um, which has given her the opportunity to develop an innate knowledge of the state's natural areas and plant communities. Hope has worked for the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, environmental engineering firms, and the Rhode Island Department um, of Environmental Management. She's also worked as a contract botanist for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Rhode Island Refugee Complex, and the Nature Conservancy. Additionally, she has consulted for many um, of the state's nonprofit organizations and land trusts to document rare plant populations, native plant communities, and invasive species, as well as providing public outreach on these topics. She's an adjunct faculty member at RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design, where she teaches um, various topics in history, philosophy, social sciences, and landscape architecture. Lastly, in 2009, um, at the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, she formed a native plant propagation program called the Rhodey Native Initiative. Since that time, Hope has applied her understanding of native plant communities in plant growth habitats to the sustainable procurement of wild collected seed, native plant propagation, and consultation with land managers for habitat restoration. So without further ado, I hand this over to Polly and Hope. And here we go on part one of the Ecotypic Seed School. So thank you, Sephra uh, and uh, Nofa for your vision in having um, this uh, seed program, uh, the Seed School. I think it's uh, very important and the message that we're sharing today we hope that um, will help you in determining how you move forward with native plant seed production or plant production and, and hopes that you are able to do it in an ecologically and genetically sensitive manner. So um, Hope and I are going to go through our presentation and we'll um, be adding into each of our conversations as we go as co-presenters and I'll start it off and we'll switch back and forth. So um, if as said, if you have any questions as we go, you know, please put them into the chat feature. So let me share my screen here. I wanted to say while you're doing that, Polly, um, I'm going to add a couple of links into the chat, um, which are resources that you might um, be interested in looking up if you're if you have an inclination to get into um, producing native plant seed on a larger scale that great and i will add some when i'm done speaking at the beginning as well that will be helpful hopefully so um so i always like to begin presentations with talking about um the outline for the program and the presentation and then also uh, what the goals are so the outline for today is um, first to define native uh, identify what seed transfer zones are and why they're important to the conversation that we're having. Um, provide a case uh, for ecotypic plant materials and, and why are we putting all this effort into producing these plant materials. Um, and then some plant material and genetic considerations um, to um, think about as you're developing your programs and how to maintain um, you know, genetically diverse native plants. Uh, production. So our goal would be um, after this presentation is that you would understand what an ecotype is and what seed transfer zones are, why these ecotypic plant materials are important, and how to advance ethical and genetic diverse plant material production. Oops, going the wrong way here. So there's many definitions of native. Um, and this is something that we would, you know, is, is really important to understand as we move forward with defining an ecotype. Um, because native is encompassing uh, generally to uh, geographic areas or uh, political boundaries, 
And for us, when we're defining native, we first like to highlight what we're defining native as pre-colonial. So native plants that existed here before uh, colonial um, European colonization came and brought in a wealth of additional species that started a mass immigration um, and introductions of um, the non-native plants. Um, and also just started um, to advance the climate change that is causing some uh, movement of uh, plants and animals that are facilitated more by modern industrialization. So native plants can be identified geographically as native to North America, um, you know, finding down to the United States, to the Eastern US, um, down to New York, and then within New York, um, and I use New York because I'm from New York as an illustrative example, um, down to the county uh, area. And how you, um, you can see here that uh, under the New York Flora Atlas identifies a species that I like to highlight is Rebecca herta in this process. You know, it is a species that's native to North America, the United States. It is native um, to the Great Plains, but it's not native to New York and, nor the Eastern United States. And if you're looking to identify whether something is native, you can look at the New York Flora Atlas and identify um, its uh, level of nativity here. It's identified as not native and it's been naturalized, but you can also see where um, it's found. Um, I would take this as detected, um, not necessarily full occurrence because it, it's not 100% accurate. It has to be identified as being there and put into this map. But um, Rebecca Herta, is not native to um, the Atlantic coastal plain or um, to the, the Northeast, but it is a species that is native to the United States and native to the Great Plains and widely utilized. And so other areas that you, references that you can go to to identify whether your plant is native to uh, the Northeast is to utilize the Go Botany platform uh, and look up your species there and it'll also tell you uh, the level of uh, nativity and also identifies here on whether it's native to your county or not. And that'll be important as we talk about ecoregions. And the same here um, in New York, where the Euthamia caroliniana is, is a coastal uh, species. So as we also define um, nativity, we, we talk about um, native ours, you hear about native, native ours in the market regularly. And you know, these are um, plant species that are derived from um, a native plant population, but are selections for a particular trait by the industry, um, generally because they're of showy flower, they produce a lot of fruit. Um, they have unique, unique or unusual features like variegation or stature, or they're, they're dwarfed, um, you know, being a novelty. And they also have um, maybe selected, especially for plant materials programs, for sediment erosion control or biofuels for a particular amount of biomass or growth form or habit. Um, so when, you know, all of these selections can be important for a particular functions and uses, but when it comes to uh, restorations and or um, uh, landscaping plantings or wildlife, there's a number of trade-offs that need to be considered with the use of native ours. And so these aren't uh, synonymous with an ecotype um, because the ecotype I'll talk about a little bit further has no selection associated with it, or the intention is to have no selection. Um, and this is because um, Native ours do have these trade-offs that occur as you select for these particular traits. Uh, you can have increased disease susceptibility because of the means in which these plants are developed, especially when they're de developed using cuttings or clones. They may be beautiful, but they tend to be uh, limited in their function, especially when the flowers are modified. Uh, if you have something that has a very large flower or showy flower or numerous petals, what happens is that the plant only has so much energies and it has to compensate from those energies by losing a certain other part of um, its structure. And in many times that is, loses the ability to reproduce. It doesn't have the nectar or pollen. Um, and it can also change the flowering time, uh, the phenology um, so that they're not aligning and blooming when the pollinators are active. 
So the, the challenge in that with the loss of the, the pollen structures is that you don't get the reproduction, but you also don't get the pollen exchange um, that is necessary in food resources for the pollinators. In event that they do have the opportunity for pollen exchange, um, you can actually have the loss of adaptations uh, through outbreeding depression. Um, that's where certain traits that are more dominant show up that may not be as uh, adapted to the local environments that then cause a, a plant, the next generation plant to not be as fit and tolerant of the environment in which it's planted. Um, and then one of the last things is that due to modifications of the fruit and the seed of the plant, um, there can be a negative consequence of native ours in that the fruit is not as palatable um, or available, readily available to the wildlife that depend upon it. So it can be impacting the food resources and availability to our wildlife by utilizing these native ours. Um, so, um, and then there's a wealth of unknown consequences and uh, related to wildlife habitat, to genetics of populations, to climate change and, and economic loss to growers that are not growing native plants um, that are ecotypes if the native ours continue to be readily available. And so we highlight some references here at the bottom if you're interested in learning more about the implications of using native ours. But we highlight that because that tends to be a question that we have and whether or not um, the, um, uh, the plant is of ecotypic region, uh, ecotype or not. And so what a native ecotype is, is it's a plant species from a particular region or area or ecosystem um, where it is selected from its native plant population. And when I say selected, I say collected, not selected for a particular trait. It's the straight line species. There's been no selection of the genetics of that plant or collected from one single individual that you're collecting the seed of, from the population. And by utilizing um, ecotypic plant material or genotypes, which um, it may also be referred to, is the resulting benefit is you're, re you're retaining the genetics um, that have been encapsulated within that plant, which is its genotype. Um, over the long period of time where it's adapted to the local environment. And by doing that, you're ensuring that you're selecting the most uh, fit uh, species and individuals that can be utilized back into the natural environment that are gonna be adopted to the, um, the, the local environment. So they're gonna be adapted to the soils, to the climate, to the, um, the seasonality and they're gonna be the ones that are gonna thrive uh, most successfully and help ensure the long-term population persistence and reproductive success. And I would say that the caveat here with an ecotype is that the goal is to use it back into the area, the, the ecoregion in which it was selected. And so what I have here um, illustrating this is the EPA's uh, ecoregion maps that define um, uh, ecoregion boundaries. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, hold on one second. This is the ecoregion level four, and it's divided into uh, different areas based upon um, climate and soils, uh, temperate areas, shoreline proximity. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in a second. But within Connecticut, there's, a, it, I'm not as familiar, so forgive me, but there's, it looks at least there's three different uh, eco regions in the, um, or sub eco regions within the um, eco region 59. So that provides, um, you know, great opportunity in Connecticut for doing mass seed production using um, an ecotypic um, map. So one of the reasons that we use uh, ecoregions um, is that these are the factors that really have influenced and adapted the plants and the seed diversity over time through evolution, um, and exposure to different uh, abiotic and biotic conditions. And so, as I mentioned before, um, you know, latitude and elevation are very influential on plants um, and their growing time and period. It influences the, the temperature and the seasonality, the day length, um, and all of those things can trigger germination of the plants and also the phenology 
and how they move through their growing season. And so over time, these plants have adapted um, to those different conditions, as well as what type of levels of precipitation, whether it's rainfall or snow, as well as lack thereof uh, and droughty conditions, uh, especially that we experience on Long Island with our very sandy soils. Um, and so, as I mentioned just now, the soil type is not only the droughtiness um, and the texture of the soil that influences these plant materials and whether they're able to survive, but it's also the nutrient availability, the pH or the acidity, uh, how much organic content is able to be maintained and uh, available to help sequester nutrients or hold those nutrients in the soil and make them available to the plant materials. And then also the mycorrhiza and the fungal community is so critically important uh, to our native plant populations. And all of those have interacted together um, in adapting and evolving the plants to helping ensure that they continue to persist on the landscape over thousands of years. Um, on Long Island and um, up in the Northeast, we also need to take into consideration the coastal influences, the coastal proximity as it relates to hurricanes and flooding and storms, but also that daily tidal action as well that can fluctuate with the moon cycles. And then the, uh, the history of fire, uh, Long Island, yeah, is a fire regimen as well as areas in the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens ecoregion, which is uh, ecoregion 84 here. It extends, um, I'll go back, oops, sorry. Ooh. Well, New Jersey, so it extends from New Jersey all the way up across Long Island and into Massachusetts. Um, so fire is also a very formative force. And on the biotic end of things, you have the competition uh, between plants, um, that is very uh, influential uh, in an ecological sense, as well as symbiotic relationships. And, and this is really directly tied to pollination. So over hundreds of years, uh, the pollinators have been pollinating the plants and the plants have been providing food resources to the pollinators and attracting them. And over time, they have de developed um, rhythms and uh, reflective of uh, bloom cycles and temperature. And so that symbiotic relationship is critical to maintain. Um, I would say additionally, the pests and disease pressures are as influenced by the abiotic conditions are also important to consider um, as far as defining ecoregions because the plants that are growing in these ecoregions areas are going to have the most tolerance and ability um, to survive outbreaks of disease and pests. So we highlight the ecoregions and what they are um, as those uh, geologic, ge those soil driven uh, abiotic conditions, um, weather conditions, as well as the, the biotic influences, because this is one way in which we can identify what is an ecologically and environmentally appropriate way of determining um, what would be ethical and appropriate as far as how to determine where you can move your seed from or use your seed within. And so these seed transfer zones um, are defined here and you can use the ecoregions to utilize these seed trans these ecoregions to utilize as a seed transfer zone to define your collection area for the seed and the populations within those areas, but then also areas in where once you produce the plant material, what would be the most uh, ecologically appropriate or genetically appropriate way of distributing those plant materials uh, back out into the landscape to maintain the uh, historic uh, genetic populations and function of those species. So it's effectively de defining the boundary of your seed transfer zone. So Hope, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yes, so I wanted to talk briefly about um, some of the programs that are in the United States um, to um, assist in producing seed of native plants um, for use in restoration. And you can see by these blue dots that they are primarily in the west of the country and they are um, run through the Bureau of Land Management um, through a program called Seeds of Success. And that has largely um, 
sort of set the stage for the protocols that we follow um, in terms of seed collection and management of seed. And um, one of the sort of issues that has um, held the industry, if you will, um, behind in the Northeast is the sort of lack of federal Bureau of Land Management property and um, lack of large scale restorations that have been going on similar to, there just aren't any that are similar in scale to what's going on out West. Um, and so largely um, the work that's been done in this area has been through small nonprofit organizations like Polly's and like um, the program that I had started and there's a pro program in Maine and you know they're just very sparsely located and very small largely run uh, by volunteers um, on shoestring budgets and you know not really a sustainable way of going. Um, Polly, can you switch to the next slide? Polly, <laughs> can you switch to the next slide? Polly, you're on mute. Thank you, there. Um, and so we did have, there is a program that is, um, has been um, pretty robust in the mid-Atlantic states called the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank, which was begun um, on Staten Island in New York, really to service the Manhattan and, um, and New York area for um, native plant restorations. Um, and it has sort of grown over the years into a larger more mid-Atlantic program. Um, after Hurricane Sandy um, in 2014, um, some federal money was allocated and then um, what was at the time the New England Wildflower Society, which is now the Native Plant Trust, um, stepped in and um, was able to collect native plant seed in concert with the mid-Atlantic folks um, to collect all along the coast from southern Maine um, down through um, Delaware and, and uh, Virginia. But um, that's really been the big push um, for a bulk of, of native plant seed collection and it's being uh, banked and is available um, for restoration projects. Um, into the future, but it's a it's a very small beginning, and it's um, it was you know one one time, and um, one of the things that we, in order to keep programs like this going or keep the restorations going with local um, seed material, we really need a a bigger, more robust um, program throughout the Northeast. Um, so can you go to the next slide? I'm not sure. Um, so uh, this part of the program will really talk more about what the why of what we're doing. You know, why are we growing um, native ecotip, uh, ecotypic plants? Um, and, you know, it really has to do with these relationships that have built up over millions of years, hundreds of millions of years between insects and plants and also between insects and birds and the whole ecology that is surrounding that. Can you go to the next one? Did you um, so at, the, at present and when we sort of all started these programs, many native plants that were available for um, habitat restoration were largely coming from outside of southern New England. Um, many were coming from the Midwest or the um, southern states. And um, that really puts a very different genetic material on the landscape. Um, southern plants often lack cold hardiness. So depending how far south they're coming from, this map, which is a USDA plants database map shows 
red maple, really common species throughout the East um, as existing from, you know, the far, far Northern parts of Canada down to Florida and Texas. And you can imagine that those plants, even though they're the same species, have a very different set of environmental conditions that they are adapted to. Um, not even just day length um, and, uh, you know, photo period over the course of the year, um, but cold hardiness or heat tolerances. Um, so these are, these are some of the things that, you know, plants, even though they are the same species, have a wide range of, of um, differences in terms of their genetic makeup. Um, many of them um, that are more Southern have um, shorter dormancy requirements. They leaf out earlier. Um, the fruiting timing or, and even sometimes the flowering timing can be off um, in relation to the species in the location that these plants were sort of transplanted into. But also more importantly, they can be out of sequence with the insects that are depending on them for pollen or the birds that are migrating that are depending on them for fruit being ripe. Um, can you go to the next one? Um, so do you wanna step in Polly? Do you wanna maybe? Or I guess I'm never mind. I'll continue. Um, so Happy to. I, I just have lost track in my mind what comes after this. So, <laughs> so I, I but I guess it it never mind. I'll I'll continue. Um, so uh, you know, native plants are are really providing because of this coevolution. They're really providing um, critical um, food resources and habitat for many insects and other wildlife being birds, um, could even be reptiles like box turtles. Um, and they you know, depend on those for the foliage, for um, larval insects need to eat that foliage. They're adapted to the chemicals in the plants um, and can tolerate them to some extent. Um, they're dependent on the, the protein in the pollen and the carbohydrates in the nectar and the fats in the seeds and you know everything that is critical to their survival as well as the structure that that the native plants in their environment have that they are familiar with and use for nesting or camouflage um, or um, reproductive you know displays mating displays um, as well as as overwintering in terms of um, insects that burrow under bark or burrow into the roots and into foliage and stems. I mean, it's, it's a very complex cycle. Uh, next. I just would add, um, yeah. Hope is that, you know, it's a little question for the audience is the, you know, what they see as the difference between these two images, uh, these two plants, um, and feel free to add in the chat button. But you know, I we created this slide to utilize this as an illustrated example of what Hope was just speaking about as related to palatability and, and forage and wildlife habitat of native plants versus non-native plants. So um, you know, when you look at the differences here, we have a black cherry and we have a boxwood, which is a non-native species. Um, but there's no forage on the leaves of the boxwood where you know, there's a wealth of signs uh, here as far as uh, habitat and uh, food resources on the black cherry related. You have an egg mass, you have forage on the leaves, you got some shot holes, which are additional forage. So you have you know, shelter reproduction and food resources provided by the native plant where the toxins in, um, within the boxwood have, you know, the, the, the foraging insects that are native here haven't developed the tolerance for the enzymes contained in the plant as those that are able to forage on the black cherry have co-evolved and had, you know, have their own little uh, chemical war going on as far as the plant trying to keep the animal from foraging upon it, but they have co-evolved together. So they have the enzymes and the tolerance to be able to forage on the native plants. 
Awesome. Ooh, I know Florida. Yeah. So there are just, we have some examples, um, the azalea sphinx moth um, feeding on a viburnum dentatum. Um, and you can probably just roll through these fairly quickly, um, I think. Um, and these are, you know, many of the plant species that are native are host species for insect, particular species of insect larva. Um, and one of the really poignant examples of this is with the um, ash species, which are now being threatened, of course, by the emerald ash borer. And the loss of the species of ash that we have on our New England landscape because of the emerald ash borer will cause the loss of 95 species of insects that specialize in feeding on ash trees. And what that does in terms of a cascade for bird species, we don't know because we haven't seen it yet um, exactly um, to its you know, fullest extent. Um, can you, um, yeah. So there are just, there are many, you know, examples that are, are just, oh, it's missing the, caterpillar it says on, it's on the oh, oh there it the is animation okay. is still there <laughs> yeah um <laughs> so this is a um this these are just some of the examples that are just astounding when you start to to look for them or see them and observe the the relationships um this little green caterpillar with its scaly skin is um feeds on the needles of Eastern red cedar. Um, and it only feeds on Eastern red cedar. And it is perfectly camouflaged to look like the needles of the Eastern red cedar. And down below this sort of lichen colored um, butterfly is, is its butterfly in the adult form. And then also, you know, camouflaged to look like lichen. Um, and then, you know, the, um, sassafras is one of the species that is a host plant for the larva, larva of the spice bush swallowtail. Also, spice bush is a, is a host plant. But without those two plants, we would not have the spice bush swallowtail. Um, and the meadow rue, um, which is a common wetland species, um, is a host plant for this little Canadian owlet moth larva. And, and it's a it's, um, moth that looks very much like a, a leaf. Um, so, and the next one, probably. And, you know, these examples, the evening primrose moth nectars on evening primrose and the dogbane beetle feeds only on dogbane and the monarch caterpillar larva feeds on milkweeds, you know, so there are these very specific relationships and without humans really at this point um, participating in this and, and putting more of these plants on the landscape um, and connecting habitats, which Polly will get into in, in a few minutes, um, we will lose these as well, like uh, can you go on to the next one? Sure. I just wanted to add about this slide is that one thing that you may notice, as, especially those that are farmers, is that these are species that uh, these plant species, the primrose, the Asclepia, and the dogbane are all species that are common, that are native, um, but also commonly looked upon as agricultural weeds um, and, um, you know, sprayed and tilled under, um, but it's actually a very important habitat to many of our native uh, pollen, native insects. Thanks, yeah. Um, and so, you know, the um, American lady butterfly, the um, feeds on pearly and sweet everlasting, another um, <laughs> species that's thought to be um, a pest in, in agricultural fields. And, and you can see yeah, in the upper right-hand corner, the the image is the chrysalis and 
it's just so perfectly camouflaged to fit the plant, you know, with that white hairy surface and hanging down like the, the leaves. I mean, all of these have long, long um, co-evolutions. Um, and many of our um, larval host plants are rare or they support rare insect species. Like in these examples, um, the dusky elfin, which is a vulnerable species, the uh, Carner blue butterfly, which is federally endangered and no longer in Rhode Island. And I'm not sure how it is in New York, but um, the frosted elfin, which is threatened. Um, and, you know, they feed on lupin, common lupin, the, the, the native blue northeast lupinus perennis um, that is uh, because of really loss of habitat becoming rarer on the landscape and considered in Rhode Island a species of state concern um, is a host plant for these species as is the um, yellow indigo, the Baptisia tinctoria. Um, so there's, you know, and, and many states unfortunately um, Rhode Island, I can speak from particularly, um, has no protection for plants, really. If, if it's a federally endangered plant, then um, regulations apply. But if it is a state endangered species, there really is no protection for it. And there's no management set in place for it. And so the way that we have been having to go about it is by saying, well, this supports a rare insect species. And so we should have in place a program to augment these species on the landscape. Right, and the same goes in New York as well. Um, the protections are only when they are either on, in, uh, federally uh, endangered, federally listed, or if they do occur on public lands, then the public land managers, they are protected in that way. But if they're on private lands, then th there's no protections for them. The landowner can do uh, with the plant materials as they, as they would like. Um, I would say about the common lupin in New York, as far as its status, is that it is not listed as endangered or threatened. Um, we do have the Carter Blue Butterfly at the Albany Pine Bush in Albany. Um, the Albany Pine Bush manages their pine, their 3,000 acres uh, extensively for the common lupin. But on Long Island, um, uh, we are seeing a mass decline in the species, and it's not being listed because it's abundant in other parts of the state, but because we are in the coastal plain, we have a high level of development and we have not had uh, prescribed fire or wildfire um, regularly due to fire suppression. We've lost um, the common lupine uh, almost extensively from Long Island. Um, and we're hoping through our fire program that we can rejuvenate the populations. But it's, it's a kind of a keystone example of species that are being lost that are early successional uh, species because fire is not a readily readily uh, valuable part of um, the landscape anymore. Okay. Um, and in terms, you know, there are a number of, of um, violets that are host species um, for larva, um, for the northern fritillary butterfly, um, and um, for the regal fritillary butterfly. And so if you if we mow these and lose these really delicate species, they then we end up losing these, these butterflies as well. Um, can you go on to the yeah. next one? Um, so as I was saying earlier, you know, plants and insects have a long history of coevolution, um, 370 million years, which is really thought to be the beginning of, of angiosperms in their ancient forms and the relationships between pollen and, and insects getting protein from pollen. And um, uh, the example at the top, the photograph is a shad, which is blooming in May in coastal areas along sand dunes. Um, and at the same time, the mining bee, which is a tiny little um, like a, a um, sweat bee um, is, it's a ground nester and it's um, laying its eggs in the ground. There's really at this time of the season, nothing else that's blooming. Um, you could get some beach plum 
later in the sort of span of time, but initially the shad is the first and the timing of the mining bee egg laying is timed to the flowering of the shad. And so this is one of these really critical um, attunements and rhythms that's going on in the landscape. Um, do you wanna talk some more about this slide, Polly? Or you have? I, I think that it's, you know, I think it's, we've really covered it. It's just really a summary that, um, you know, flowers are blooming at a certain time based upon the weather conditions and the pollinators have adapted to that. And so utilizing native plants within the ecoregion is gonna help ensure that a biorhythm attunement continues. Uh, if you're using plants like native ours that, or cultivars um, that are from other areas, they may bloom sooner or bloom later. And then the, the plant resources uh, that they need in order to continue their life cycles uh, will not. Um, so it's really important reason for ensuring the evolutionary history and the phenology is aligned between the plants and the animals. Yeah. Okay. And phenology is the, the, the stage of the plant over the season. So whether it's breaking blood, breaking bud, leafing out, flowering, setting seed, that's sort of different phenological stages of the plant. So one of the, as an urban ecologist, this is something that I have been studying extensively, um, you know, both through uh, my studies and my thesis, but, you know, utilizing native plants in your landscaping, having a ready, ready available um, plant materials within nursery and landscaping for purposes of planting in the home landscape is one of the most useful and, and critical needs in these highly developed areas. This is a highly developed area of Long Island in the middle of the island. Um, you can see that the only natural areas are around the roads uh, or in wetlands areas where the wetlands have protected them from being developed. So you can imagine if you are a plant in these areas and you die off and the next population is adjacent, how challenging it would be for uh, recruitment and colonization to occur from the seed to move from one location to another or conversely, how challenging it would be for a butterfly or a bird to move between these landscapes or even a mammal that's traveling on foot uh, to move between um, these natural areas in order to find uh, food or shelter um, or overwintering habitat. So one of the most important opportunities that I see is by producing mass amounts of ecotypic plant materials and getting them into the home landscape is that we re repopulating uh, the natural plants within that urban landscape is providing stepping stones between these isolated populations of native habitat. Um, especially as we're starting to, you know, really dramatically see the impacts of such dense uh, fragmentation and development. We're losing our species within our populations because those species are not, be able, to, are not able to move naturally between the populations. There's invasive species that are moving into those habitats and taking up uh, habitat that would otherwise be available to less competitive native plants. And then we're seeing significant declines, not surprisingly, unfortunately, but of uh, insects and pollinator species um, and the increased listing of threatened and endangered species. So utilizing these opportunities for increasing connectivity by planting native ecotypic plant materials in home landscapes um, and on roadsides is provide, has the opportunity to provide that critical connectivity that has been and continues to be lost in our urban landscapes. So we use this, these two slides just really to tie all of this together of you know, what Hope and I have been talking about as far as um, ecologically, the importance of helping ensure that um, you know, the plants and animals continue to persist. You know, the, the flora is so critically important. It provides that foundation for our wildlife. Uh, it provides those food networks um, in the cascading chains to support our ecosystems, you know, between providing the foliage and the pollen, the protein and the carbohydrates through the nectar, 
um, hydration by collecting water and water resources and then providing the shelter in order to help facilitate uh, overwintering and the next stages of reproduction. You know, that's it's critical. And if you lose any part of this arch of these plant materials, then it collapses. And so when we look at the, the, the faunal pollinators and how important they are uh, to provide pollinator services, 80% of the flowering plants, which is about 240,000 species, are dependent on invertebrates for the movement of pollen. And 25% of the birds and mammals, um, of, of birds and mammals diet is dependent on uh, pollen um, and pollinators. So the other critical thing to think about when you think about faunal pollinators is that you know some species are open pollinated or wind pollinated, and others um, depend on the pollinators to move that pollen. And it's not just the the effect of moving the pollen and pollinating, but it's the effect of transferring the genes from plant to plant, and that's really what helps facilitate evolution and maintain adaptions over time. And so, if that pollen is the next neighbor um, and isn't a diverse pollen um, that's being moved by these pollinators from uh, adjacent po populations to, uh, the, to the species, then that adaptation and that genetic mixing is not occurring. Um, and we need seeds. Seeds are our insurance for the future. They contain the genetic material and the embryo to help facilitate repopulation um, and ensure that those populations continue to grow and thrive over time as the older uh, individuals and then the population uh, or the weaker die out. So the faunal pollinators really drive the, the, the food webs. Um, you think about the food that's sourced from the plants um, is that 89% of birds forage on insects, those invertebrates that in part are being supported by, uh, by plants. So, um... This is, you know, as I was talking before, this um, the efforts are, are on the East Coast are, are sort of limited to small organizations, small growers and small nonprofit organizations. Um, but there has been a, a push, particularly out West, um, to get some more um, sort of a broad coverage in terms of um, the people who can contribute to this. And um, the uh, uh, Forest Service came out with this publication, the Nursery Manual for Native Plants as a guide for tribal um, nations to start nurseries and um, be able to grow the um, cultural resources that were important for traditions in food and, and traditions in um, basketry and dye. And, um, and one of the, really good examples of this um, is out in New Mexico, just uh, between Santa Fe and, and Albuquerque, uh, the Santa Ana Pueblo. And they source seed um, from the Santa Ana Pueblo lands and they grow native plants for use for restoration as well as for um, sale to landscape architects um, and to um, homeowners. And it's just a, a, it's a, it's a nice big, you know, fairly good sized nursery. And um, it was, uh, Polly and I were out at the National Seed Conference a few years ago and, and there was a field trip to this nursery and it was, it was really impressive and great to see. I mean, it was just, it was like walking into a candy shop. <laughs> it was great. And can you go to the next one? Um, sort of more local um, work, the Narragansett tribe is, um, has finally in 2018 um, put up, ha has some land to grow food on and, and have a food sovereignty initiative that they've been working on for a number of years. And it's really begun to come into its own. Um, and they were able to put up these two greenhouses and, and really focusing on food um, for the people of the tribe, but also um, a really strong interest for obvious reasons in um, native plants for the cultural 
um, significance that they provide um, for dye, for weaving, for um, as well as for food. Um, and so this is an example of, of some other things that are going on on the landscape in, in support of um, native plants and native plant um, propagation. Um, can you go on to the next one? I'm not sure where we are. So ah, this is okay. um, a summary on just of what we've talked about um, is why we put so much effort and why we advocate and um, into um, invest into the needs for native plant production that are ecotypes. Um, and just re-highlight that, you know, ecotypes are genetically native plant materials to a particular region or ecosystem that are to be used back into that ecosystem. So cultivars are a uh, selection of a particular plant material from a location. Um, but because they've been modified or changed or selected for a particular trait, they're not uh, ecotypes. So we're looking to have um, production of plant materials that are genetically native and representative of the native plant populations that occur in those predefined seed transfer zones of those ecoregions. And I'm not going to read the, the entire list here. Um, it's just a reminder um, to go back through um, as far as, you know, this is all really uh, studied and defined and shown that, you know, how important these genetic adaptations are to persist the plant persistence and the population persistence over time and how those plants support and are aligned with our pollinators and our and natural environment. They've survived here for thousands of years because of this, these adaptions, because of the strongest, the most fit the most successful uh, reproducers and by helping facilitate uh, these species and that genetic variability on the landscape, we're going to be providing the uh, most um, useful and productive and sustainable plant materials um, that are going to mesh within our ecosystems and help protect our natural environment and ourselves. Do you want to take this? Sure. Do you want so, to? <laughs> um, we have to, I think we have to move along quickly because we're. Yes. Yeah. Um, we're there. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of why these, why these selection and production considerations are important. Some of the things that, that are being produced in the horticultural trade um, that are, you know, so, that are have their origins in native species, I should say. So why don't you go on to the next one and we'll... Um, so as Polly was saying earlier, you know, seeds carry the genetic information that represent the adaptations of the population or of a population across the landscape. Um, and they are the potential for that plant species as well as for the whole plant communities um, sustainability and because of the biodiversity that they have. Um, and so the um, horticulture industry really produces plants based on our human aesthetics and growing convenience and um, things that are, you know, predictable. Um, native plants produced from seed are not predictable. They are unique individuals, each and every one of them. And um, they take longer to grow in many cases in terms of being going from a seedling to a flowering plant, which is also something that in terms of horticultural practices is time too time consuming. You know, if you take a cutting, it will flower much sooner um, and become a reproductive plant um, on a much faster time scale. But the cuttings are selected from one individual usually because it has a particular aesthetic value that people find advantageous. And so all you're getting from that plant, and it could be plants sold all across the country originating from one plant, are that one plant's genetics. And if you're using that in particular for restoration, it's not, it doesn't have the full suite of things that that it could have 
in order to be able to um, adapt to, you know, dramatic temperature differences or in or pathogens or insect infestations. Um, and if you're even, I would go so far as to say, if you're putting it in your in your landscape in your yard, all of our landscapes are inserted, at least in the rural parts and, and suburban parts of, of the country, they're inserted into wild areas. And so if you have a, say, an arrowwood that is, you know, a cutting from some particular arrowwood sourced down in New Jersey, I'm just sort of hypothetically talking, that genetics will be transferred back and forth among the population um, in the woods in Foster, Rhode Island, for example. And what that does to that population in Foster, Rhode Island, we don't really know. Um, so why don't, do you wanna go? So, um, and there, um, in terms of um, uh, hybrids, um, you know, you, you lose, well, in terms of cuttings, you lose some of the features of the native plant itself. One example is, is inkberry, Ilex glabra. Um, by taking cuttings, the plants are, you know, these nice, neat um, shrubs that don't spread colonially, don't spread by underground um, stems and root systems like they do in the, in the wild. Um, and so what we're losing is an ecological strategy for, um, for existing across a landscape that um, may or may not have an advantage. Um, it certainly has an advantage to the species, but whether it has an advantage to other species, we don't know. Um, and in many cases, um, the hybrids are made between vastly different species. And in the case of inkberry, again, the um, hybrid cultivar known as sparkleberry is a cross between a North American species and a Japanese species. So we're, we're, we're crossing species from different continents to produce something that is aesthetically pleasing. Um, so there are protocols that, that we follow. Um, the um, Seeds of Success has developed extensive protocols and they're pu well published. Um, the Native Plant Trust follows those protocols and has their own sort of writing of them. So you could, you could um, access that through the Native Plant Trust. Um, and it's ba basically the protocols are put in place to preserve the populations, allow them to continue to be viable populations. So the collection size from a particular population is limited to 10% of that population of the available seed on a given day, um, which is actually can be quite a lot of seed. And this is really for wild collection. Um, and, you know, collecting from multiple individuals, 25 or more, um, in order to get that genetic diversity, as well as collecting from different populations within the ecoregion so that you're capturing something that another population might contain um, and collecting throughout the period of time when the seed is, is ripe so that you're also collecting a variety of genetic information because some individuals flower early and some individuals flower late. And there may be an advantage to that in terms of an insect pest that will eat the seed or an insect pest that will eat the flower or you know something. There's, um, there is a strategy there or, or an adapted strategy. Um, I think you could go on to the next one. Okay. And so um, again, sort of rephrasing, um, you know, just collecting um, from a number, well, what, do you have something you want to add to this one? Um, no, I think for the considerations here for maximizing genetic diversity, we're trying to, you know, collect the genetic diversity of the population. And so when you're out collecting, um, you know, ensuring that you are collecting from as many different species of different sizes and shapes and colors, we're drawn to the biggest and brightest and the ones that produce the most seed. But that's no different than creating a cultivar. So we're looking to collect 
the variability within the population. Um, and in doing so, that's the maximum amount of genetic variability that you'll ever have in your seed production or your plant material production. So by doing that, that helps ensure that maximal diversity because each step of the way that you advance for your seed production activities is going to lose, has a potential to you know, lose, you're not gonna gain genetics, you're gonna lose genetics. And so it's important to collect from as many populations, from as many plants as you can. But you also wanna consider you know, your, um, your work and what you're doing based on um, the ecoregion that you're collecting on, but also your focal plant species. So grasses, especially warm season grasses are wind pollinated. So you, the definition of populations there may be a little different um, or the seed transfer area where, you know, maybe Long Island seed may be appropriate to use within the ecoregion in Massachusetts. But species that are pollinator dependent, um, those insects aren't going to fly as far. So the genetic variability within those populations may be different and it may not be as appropriate to move that plant material um, as far away as you might otherwise. So these are just things that we threw out there as far as, you know, helping you maximize that genetic diversity within that initial seed that you collect and as you continue to move forward with your production activities. Um, you know, seed is such a invaluable resource and it's the genetics within it that we're really trying to capture and preserve and maintain through this production so that we are producing very fit individuals on the landscape, especially for restorations. You really want that plant material to successfully establish and persist in the landscape to protect the environment. Um, and then within the home landscapes, you wanna be able to sell plant materials that people are going to enjoy and love and continue to foster and appreciate and expand their use of. Ladies. Uh, oh. I know. And that's I think all we have. That's the end. <laughs> We're sorry, we've, we've oh, talked no, so please. long there. It's time to move we on. We have one minute. We have one minute. I think you did perfect. That is the perfect <laughs> amount of time. Um, and, and Michael has been great in the chat and Alexis um, answering some of the questions. Uh, for everyone who is listening in, thank you so much, Hope and Polly. That is such a great framework as we go into part two of Seed School with Michael Butts and Alexis Doshash, who will talk about how to actually implement this on the landscape. So if everyone can sign back in, they have to sign out and sign back into the other Zoom. I also put a survey in the link. Please open it or download it before you leave. Uh, the Ecotype Project works under a USDA specialty crop lock grant where our specialty crop is the ecotypic seed. And part of our deliverables is conducting this survey to see how many people we can involve with this work and um, teach through these seed school efforts. So thank you so much. And oh. now on to how we can fortify this in our living seed banks so hope to see you all in just 15 minutes and um thank you again ashley and hope and polly my pleasure thank you thank you all